Good evening. It's an honor to be here um, to welcome our two distinguished guests. I want to begin by also thanking and recognizing the partnership with uh, the team, Grace Asher's team, with Seth Ogilvy. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to collaborate, to also recognize the team of CLAX, uh, Professor Gretchen Selke, Alma Pasa Miguel, Avery Dickinson Giron, Paula Covington, um, and to recognize in particular also the Brazilian Studies Working Group, and I see Ben Leg here, and thank you so much for your leadership. And this conversation builds out of several other events we've hosted this year related to uh, questions about Brazilian politics um, and its relationship to the U.S. more generally. So what I'm going to do today is start by giving a, a bullet point introduction of both of our guests, and then we will begin by having them introduce themselves more fully uh, as it pertains to our conversation today. Uh, the title of today's session is Elections and Insurrections, Attacks on Democracy in the U.S. and Brazil. So we are uh, honored to have with us uh, Ambassador Michael McKinley, who has served as a four-time ambassador uh, in Peru between 2007 and 2010, Colombia 2010 to 2013, Afghanistan 2014 to 2016, and Brazil 2017 to 18. We are also joined tonight by Dr. Thiago Krause, a historian of the Brazilian state um, and currently a fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey. So to begin with, I'd love to ask the both of you if you can just please elaborate a little bit more on your background, on your training, on your engagement with questions about uh, elections and insurrections to give the crowd a better sense of your background. You want me to start then? Uh, but first, uh, I just uh, uh, want to join uh, my own words and thoughts uh, with the people of Nashville, uh, with the victims of the terrible shooting, and uh, obviously uh, it's going to be a period of recovery for everyone and uh, is a shadow we have to live with at this time. So in terms of my background, uh, and relevance uh, for this conversation. I do have uh, the fact that I spent almost two years as ambassador in uh, Brazil, uh, and the fact that I continued to work on Brazil uh, when I returned from Brazil to the State Department in 2018, 2019, where I was senior advisor to the then Secretary of State, uh, Pompeo. And uh, that carried us through, I think, uh, uh, past Bolsonaro's election in 2018 and into a different uh, uh, relationship with the United States. But in the broader terms of uh, dealing with the issue of uh, elections, uh, conflicts, I've spent most of my career um, working on wars in different parts of the world or on peace processes in different parts of the world or in societies in transition from Central America in the middle 1980s to Southern Africa, uh, when countries like Mozambique uh, were emerging from 15, 20 years of war and moving into contested first democratic elections, and Uganda, wars in Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, and uh, then more directly as uh, an ambassador uh, working in peaceful environments in Peru, and to a lesser extent, uh, Colombia, as it was consolidating its uh, democracy, and then working on extremely contested and difficult elections in Afghanistan, uh, which required direct intervention from the United States to achieve a soft landing in 2014. So uh, with those uh, experiences, I hope uh, I can uh, shed at least some comparative light on what we're going to discuss this evening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, <coughs> I'm, uh, as uh, Celso said, I'm a historian of Brazilian state, of power, of inequality, and I've been trying to understand why is Brazil so unequal for my, my, my whole career. So what I hope to bring is this long-term perspective, and of course the fact that I'm Brazilian, I've been and lived there my whole, my whole life, so that's, uh, I think it's a more local perspective, but also the fact we always try to compare what's happening with Brazil, and we're going to do it today to understand it better, to shed light in Brazil at the same time in other places such as the United States. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so as a lead in and before we delve into January 6 and January 8, uh, more specifically, um, can you both please elaborate on what you see as the important political connections between the two between the two countries? Uh, well, I'll start again. But before I do, I neglected to point out something that's uh, very important to the three of us sitting here. All three of us are historians of the 18th and 19th centuries uh, in uh, Latin America. And to have a constellation of individuals connected that way uh, is a very rare occurrence indeed. <laughs> the next sighting will be in 67 years. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, but uh, in terms of the connectivity between our countries, it's commonplace uh, to point to the similarities between the United States and Brazil. The two largest democracies in the Western Hemisphere, uh, two countries with very diverse populations, two countries that have similarities in terms of the issues we confront, whether it's on inequalities, racial tensions, whether it's dealing with climate change, and what our role in the world is or should be going forward. And certainly uh, it's easy to sort of draw a parallel uh, at government structure level because Brazil uh, developed a new constitution in 1988, which drew from many places, but also drew from the United States. And so the democracy we have in Brazil today, very much based on the same principles of checks and balances as the United States, in a country where there's an extremely strong and independent judiciary, um, a pretty vibrant Congress, uh, but instead of two parties, uh, 15 plus, and uh, an, an executive that's strong in some ways, but uh, state governments, which are extremely strong and uh, counterparts to the federal government in other ways, and with a vast geographic landscape, the challenges of administering and developing national policies on economy, on uh, health policies on environment uh, are a challenge the way they are here, trying to develop a consensus uh, going forward. So um, it's tempting to take the parallels uh, even further, but as we will discuss this evening, I think there are fewer parallels between Brazil and the United States in terms of what happened on January 6th and January 8th than meets the eye. Thank you. I think in the, in the long run, Brazil has always looked at the United States as, since the, since the late 18th century, Brazil has looked at the United States as an example, as a possible model, or something to copy, or sometimes to avoid. So uh, there was the, when there was the first turns of uh, independence movements in the late 18th century in Minas Gerais, the, 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 state, the first state constitutions was, were seen as an example, and then, uh, there was some feeling, even in, in, in the United States also, there could be some sort of connection. John Adams, uh, he thought that Brazil and Spanish America were Catholic, therefore they would be inferior, barbarous, or whatever. But Jefferson, for instance, he wrote in a letter in, the 18, in 1820 saying that he wanted to see the, the, the ships of the Brazilian and the United States Navy crossing the seas together. There was always an idea that some kind of comparison could be. And the, the similar, similar challenges there made Brazil always look to the United States as, a, as may, should we try to imitate, should try to copy, what about the slavery? And what happened here has always reverberated in, in Brazil since, since the 1830s afterwards. So I think the, the main question is, uh, and, to, to, uh, and to reinforce the point of the, the ambassador made, is that even if Brazil was always looking to the United States, the institutions, the social dynamics were different. So the challenge might seem very similar, but the way they were resolved, the, the, the actual developments ended up being very different. So that happened with abolition, which had, as, as we were discussing just now, it was it ended up being quite different in Brazil. It uh, because it was there wasn't a civil war because there was a this popular movement, but not exactly. And Celso would, would be the one to of us three the one to elaborate on that, and uh, and the republic. So there was 
always interaction, always comparison, always imitation, but things were always very different because Brazil had a diff uh, different institutional dynamics and socioeconomic conditions. So I think it's important to look at, at similarities, but to emphasize difference, as the, the ambassador has said. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, so these are separate questions for the, each of you. So you were in Brazil um, as the Bolsonaro campaign and, and movement uh, gained momentum. How did that look like, um, having had the reference point of uh, the Trump uh, movement in the U.S. as well? I mean, did, 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 were you reading it? What, what were some of the specificities or differences that you saw as it was kind of gaining momentum having had this um, recent outcome in the US. So that's a great and difficult question. And uh, I would just like to emphasize that uh, I was a career government official, not a political appointee uh, for my 37 years in uh, diplomacy. And uh, certainly as I, uh, President Trump's election in November of 2016, like uh, government civil servants across the United States, uh, our approach was one of preparing to work for a new government in Washington. So you weren't necessarily looking <clears throat> at developments in other countries through the lens of what was happening inside the United States. Um, I will confess that I was, but not just in the context of what was happening in the United States or in Brazil because across most of the 2010s, and I would suggest this began um, with the Great Recession in 2008, and with a questioning that began globally ab about economic progress, the future, whether globalization was bringing everything it had promised, with growing polarization in dozens of societies, with the fraying of political consensuses, with the fraying of traditional solutions, traditional political parties, traditional leaders in different environments, um, it began to manifest itself much closer to home. It happened in the United States, but we can certainly point to where it was happening in places like Poland, in Hungary. It was happening in India under the emerging uh, prime ministership of, of Prime Minister Modi. It's happening in Japan under Prime Minister Abe. It's happening in the Philippines under President Duterte. Depending on how you define populism and pop polarization, uh, I could add a dozen countries, including Boris Johnson's UK, uh, 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 Prime Minister Erdogan's Turkey, uh, Mexico under President Lopez Obrador. The reason I'm putting it in a more general context is as we look at what was happening in both the United States and Brazil, even in terms of uh, perspective with the passing of years. It was very much a reflection of something that was changing in democracies around the world. And uh, to obviously taking into account local circumstances, but very much reflecting some of the same tensions in each of the societies. The United States was growing more polarized and the same thing was happening in Brazil. So uh, I was there and arrived for the 2000, I was there for the 2018 campaign in Brazil. And in the early months, <clears throat> there was an assumption that the traditional candidates, uh, center, center right or center left, would carry the day because that was the way Brazilian politics had largely worked since the return of uh, democracy uh, from 1985 onwards. And at that point, early in uh, 2018, the elections in uh, Brazil are in October, the, uh, Bolsonaro was not seen as a front runner, but instead, over the months, build up political capital and popular support without having a foundation in a traditional political party or grouping. The parallels, I think, are there uh, for us to see in terms of how outsiders can come into an established political framework and influence what happens going forward. But in both countries, the rise uh, or success 
of then candidate Trump and candidate Bolsonaro um, were building on uh, the sense in these countries, in their populations, of very different views of what should happen going forward. And it was a battle over values, issues, uh, economic direction, engagement with the outside world. But I would suggest it was based a lot on questioning, where are we? In Brazil, it was compounded by the following. Probably the most significant political corruption scandal in a democracy in modern history or in history period. The car wash uh, scandal, the Lava Jata scandal, which at one point had engulfed something like two thirds of Brazil's <coughs> congressional representatives, was touching presidential candidates, former presidents, and opened the door for a candidate which did not, who did not have an association with any of these uh, past histories. And Bolsonaro was able to walk through that. And what we need to remember is uh, political uh, candidates also have something going in their favor usually, and it's charisma. And there was charisma, and there was an ability to organize, and there was an ability to use social media on a scale which had not been used up to that point uh, in Brazil. Again, I think the parallels, I don't have to spell them out to what happened in this country in 2016, um, are there. And, uh, and what, what was different, however, when he did uh, win the election as president of Brazil is his party only had 10% representation in the Brazilian Congress. And over the next four years, his government uh, became a government which had to negotiate almost every measure it attempted to pass. Thank you. Um, for Dr. Krause, you know, in terms of the Brazilian uh, case and insurrection, uh, we're going to bracket for right now that's international horizons and connections and symbolism. How would you explain it in terms of Brazilian history and in terms of the of, of Brazilian conservative conser conservatism? I think there's uh, this, as in a way, as in the, in the United States, but but completely separate from that, not directly influenced. There was always a backlash to any attempts to to change the the current structure. So you can see the, the backlash for the first time in the 19th century when there was the attempt to to ban the slave trade in 1831, and then there was the, what we call the conservative uh, return, the Regresso Conservador in 1837. So and then there was you can find multiple times that when the, when the social structure felt even a little bit threatened, not much, not at all. Uh, there might have been some sort of reaction. It might have been a sort of reaction in the 1960s well, or 1950s against uh, against Vargas government or against Jango in the 19 in the 1960s. So there was a, in a society that's as unequal as Brazil, in a society that took so long to actually democratize. There is as, there is always there was bound to be some sort of reaction to. Uh, to any attempts to ameliorate the situation, not transform it in a, in a revolutionary way, just to ameliorate a little bit. So you can find the roots of Bolsonaro, not not in Trump, but actually in Brazilians own Brazilians' history. What was Bolsonaro's idea? Was to turn the clock 50 years back, turn the clock back 50 years to the dictatorship, right? So that's his main his main setting point in the in the in Congress, in the 28th year he was in Congress, was being kind of a representative of the military, trying to fight for better, uh, for, for better pay, and trying to tell that the time, trying to say that the military was, wasn't at fault for the crisis of the 80s, that the, the civilians were the problem, so the military were doing everything right. So if Bolsonaro had this, could count on this reservoir of trust that President society still had uh, on the military, Brazilian society still saw, and in a way, in a way, still sees the military as trustworthy. Probably less now than five years ago, but a Bolsonaro could count on that. So you can see the roots of Bolsonaro in this extremely strong presence of, of the military in politics, which is completely different here in the United States. It's, it is a separate story. That's, 
it's connected because the Brazilian military had, at least until the 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 forties, but especially in the sixties, this strong connection of the United States. But uh, but it was previous to that. It wasn't it wasn't dependent on United States support. The, mil the military intervention policy started in the late 18th century, and it never stopped. It, right? It could sometimes disappear for ten for ten years, for twenty years, but it then reappear. So we thought we, we had gotten rid of that after the the after 1998, when the Fernando Cardoso government the administration uh, created a, a civilian uh, uh, civilian secretary of defense, but then uh, bef even before Bolsonaro, the military started to intervene uh, to intervene in politics again. They tried to intimidate the Supreme Court to 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 ban Lula from running the 2018 elections they were they were putting uh, again in, in charge of the secretary of the uh, general was again charge of secretary of defense so again this is there is this deep history of backlash and deep history of military involvement in politics so and that's absolutely essential to understand why Bra uh, the, the the brazil bolsonaro is different from trump and why january 8th wasn't exactly the same as January 6. This central role of the military, and it's a it's a fact of Brazilian politics. And all the time, people were discussing: Will the military accept Lula? Will they try uh, to do something against Bolsonaro, to do something in favor of Bolsonaro? Uh, Mourão, General Mourão, who was the Bolsonaro's vice president, he tried in a way to. As forbearance of his followers in, in social media saying, oh, we couldn't do anything because if he did, there would be an extremely strong international reaction. So what he's saying, we would, we would love to, to start a new dictatorship, but we can't because they won't let us, right? So, uh, and that's this, and we have generals running for office. Uh, in multiple, in, in multiple occasions, they usually put their name, their, their, their military rank, General something to, to to run. So this this intervention, this military presence in politics is only increasing, and not only the 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 army, but also the military police. Uh, so that that's also being extremely present in politics, and they are, in a way, even more present in the in the day to day uh, life of Brazil of Brazilian people. And they are also extremely influenced because. Crime is a major, a major fear in Brazil as well, so that's also that's also a point. But I think the the, the main thing I want to emphasize to set Brazil apart from the United States is military meddling in politics. Absolutely, and and, and it's so greatly appreciated to the two of you for you know very carefully parsing out some specificities to make sure that we're responsible in connections and intersections that we may explore and, and bring to the table. Um, that said. What intersections and connections should we think about that you think are, I mean, given, I mean, both the media framing, but also given, you know, the actors involved, especially from the Brazilian case, did point to and did embrace a particular uh, example here, right? So, so what, where do you think it is responsible to think about intersections and connections between, if at all? So uh, we'll probably not agree on this, which is okay. Which is great. Um, but I uh, don't think there are all that many intersections. The uh, January 6th in the United States and January 8th uh, in Brasilia were two very different phenomena, um, except in their outer manifestations, which uh, both involved uh, political violence against buildings against uh, institutions that were central to the national state or the federal government. Both involved uh, supporters of presidential candidates who had lost an election but were refusing to accept uh, the legitimacy of the loss. And both on the day reflected some kind of failure of the security forces, just as much in Washington as in Brasilia, to contain the violence 
uh, that emerged. But I think we have to be clear that the genesis of the two, uh, what happened on both days and what happened after those days are very distinct. In the first place, January 6th can be seen to some extent as the product or at least an extension of what was an effort the day after the elections in November 2020 to overturn the election results in the United States. And it involved the use of the president's office, White House officials, senators, congressional representatives, local state officials, developing systematic approaches which might be used legally to invalidate elector slates. And all of these things took place on a sustained basis across almost 10 weeks. In Brazil, the elections in October of last year, both in the first and second round, because they have a two round system, if a candidate doesn't get 50 plus 1% on the first round, um, it was a very different phenomenon. So after the second uh, round of the presidential elections in Brazil on October 30th, first, the votes were counted in less than 24 hours. They weren't contested by anyone other, not even uh, uh, verbally by uh, then President Bolsonaro. His supporters inside the Brazilian Congress, governors of the most powerful states in Brazil who happened to be Bolsonaro allies, accepted and endorsed the results. The heads of like the equivalents of the speaker and leaders of the House and Senate who were Bolsonaro allies, accepted and endorsed the results of the elections as legitimate. Supreme Court spoke out. All of the military uh, service branches spoke out. All of this took place in 48 hours. And in the march to the inauguration of President Lula on January 1st, the fear that the inauguration itself would be the equivalent of what happened in the United States on January 6th were completely misplaced. Almost 300,000 people turned out peacefully in Brasilia on January 1st. 17 heads of state from different countries around the world. And the inauguration went off without a hitch. January 6th, not only did we have the assault on the Capitol, but that evening after the assault on the Capitol, the majority of Republican congressional representatives and six or seven senators, 147 congressional representatives and senators in total, voted to deny certification of the legitimacy of the election of President Biden. Nothing like that happened in Brazil. In the aftermath of January 8th in Brazil, in which, by the way, a smaller crowd than the one that turned up on January 6th in Washington, and a crowd that turned up on a Sunday when there was nothing, nobody in session in Brasilia, and the president wasn't even in Brasilia, but was in Sao Paulo. The, in the aftermath, the violence was immediately condemned by political leaders uh, every stripe, including Bolsonaro's firmest supporters. The head of military of police in Brasilia was dismissed, as was the federal governor. Close to 1,500 people were arrested in the first 72 hours. A little bit of a contrast with what happened in the United States. And legal proceedings started immediately. In terms of how a Congress, which was two-thirds right of center, or centrist parties, in other words, not backing President Lula, came out and endorsed and expressed their willingness to work with the Lula administration on 
uh, different policy issues. It's a, a very different phenomenon. That's not to say that the polarization in Brazil isn't serious, that there hasn't been a degradation of some of the institutionalism, as you rightly point out, particularly with uh, the effort to bring the military more directly into administration over the four years of President Bolsonaro's administration. And it's not to say there are not dangers ahead, but when we compare the two, um, there's simply, there's, there's, there's interesting things to note that uh, they have in common, but there are different phenomenons and we need to gauge the relative strength of institutions and democracies in that light. The final point, the intersection with the United States is there. But I opened my remarks earlier talking about what was happening worldwide. So when we take a look at the stories we've seen of Steve Bannon's connections to the son of President Bolsonaro, uh, the uh, links uh, that there may be uh, with Washington and other uh, respects over the years of uh, President Bolsonaro and his supporters, um, I would think it would be more helpful to view it in the context of a worldwide phenomenon we're seeing in terms of populist politics and how it works on an international stage. And uh, would suggest that in both countries, what happens in the countries is almost entirely driven by what's happening inside those countries. They're not being they're not a production of external influences. So. I think it's Thank a bit less than, than uh, it would think, Ambassador. Uh, uh, there is, uh, <coughs> Bolsonaro seemed to have drank his own Kool-Aid. He thought he was going to win the election, so he kind of well, suffered from shell shock or whatever and stayed mostly still. There was some ideas. We had some kind of a, a Isma memo in, in, in Brazil as well. It was found in the in the in the house of his former uh, justice minister, but it's not exactly as attorney general in the United States, but somewhat somewhat close. Uh, but I think th the main difference is that the first why there was this support for Lula. That, that's important to point out for something you have mentioned before, Ambassador, which was the the fact that Brazil is a multi-party multi system, right? We don't have one party that's uh, two parties that are able to command more or less unified uh, action because because Republicans in the United States, they need to you know, to remain close to Trump because they, they might uh, get put out by, the, by their base if they don't do that. There, there isn't. Politics in Brazil aren't as current. They're much more pork barrel based. So it's easier for representatives to and, to, and for governors to buck Bolsonaro. It's the, so they, they could just let Bolsonaro draw, uh, draw himself, draw, let Bolsonaro there and try, okay, now I have to think of, about my own future and I don't want my own election to be contested. So they, 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 it was easier for them to simply ignore Bolsonaro and try to move on as nothing else ha have happened. So I think that's the institutional difference between a two-party system that are, that are ever more coherent and a multi-party multi system that it's, it's still very fragmented. It's, it's starting to, to become a little bit less, but as you said, it's 50, 15 plus. We had, at a time we had 22 parties in Congress, I think. Now it's 17 or or whatever. So it's it's still extremely weird, right? So we have a block that's more or less a center-left block with, with, that it's 30% of Congress. We have a far-right block with 70 or, uh, or 8, so it's uh, representatives, which might be 15 to 20% of Congress, and the rest it's an uh, amorphous center that, uh, that uh, it's center-right, it's, it's conservative, but it's, it can easily support a center-left government as they did before in exchange for money. So legal and illegal money, of course. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's a major difference because they can't do that because they won't, be, uh, they won't suffer because there are no primaries and the, the districts no, it's not a lot, are, are huge, not like here in the West. Every representative runs in the whole, in the, in the whole state, right? So it's, it's very hard to, and they all, them all run against everyone. So it's, it's very hard for, to say, oh, I'm going to run against this guy. I'm going to take this guy out. 
that just doesn't happen in Brazil. So the, the, the candidate who has more money, more name recognition, will usually get elected. Uh, so it's uh, the, the, institution, the institutions make a big, big difference. I think another uh, interesting difference is that even if the if, even if the government was more or less uh, even even the Bolsonaro even even the Bolsonaro administration didn't know what to do, there was there was and there was some movement inside it. A lot of the a lot of movement was in a way spontaneous. Was small business owners, small uh, uh, small uh, small to middling farmers. Uh, Owners of truck com trucker companies who, who then gave money and tried to to raise this kind of a a, a, a network and movement, but they did have a clear leader. And a central point is again the role of the military. What these people wanted? These people were in front of arm headquarters all over the country, begging the army to uh, to take power again. Right. That was that was the idea. The the January 6 had a point that was to uh, to to stop Congress to accepting and formalizing Biden's victory. The idea of January 8 in Brazil was simply to create so much chaos that the military would have an excuse to intervene and then install a dictatorship. So they were counting on the military. And they, that's why they felt betrayed when the military did nothing, right? When researchers and and, and journal, journalists who were deep into this parallel world of the of the Bolsonaristas, of Bolsonaro supporters, they they they, they uh, reported that they were complete. They felt betrayed because they thought the military were going to help them, right? When the military helped to arrest them, they felt that the, they, they couldn't accept it. There was some military tested support why why some uh, why why they were arrested the next day instead of the same day because and it was actually reported first here in the united states the washington post the the army commander said they would put tanks to stop the police to arrest uh, the 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 attackers of the, of brazilia in and in, in general in the night of january 8th so there was uh, there was the military were kind of ambiguous. They like it that the, the people are claiming for them, that the, the far right, uh, the far right agitators are claiming for them, but they weren't prepared to actually do anything because it was too risky, and they knew that, right? So, and that's why that's one of the reasons that the army commander was sacked. Just I think it's a, a week or two afterwards, right? Because he was simply seen as being too lenient. And one of the reasons also is he was given to one of the uh, closest Bolsonaro aides uh, a key military position near Brasilia. And that was, that was felt as just uh, unacceptable. Uh, Lula felt that was, that was unacceptable. And then Bolsa Lula gave the position as, as army commander to a, to a general who was filmed the day before saying that they had to respect elections. This guy was positioning himself to, uh, to to take command of army, he knew that that was the the, the what Lula was was searching. That Lula, that was Lula was seeking. So, I think that again the main difference are the institutions, the multi-party system, and second, the the army, the the role of the army. And uh, in a way, it's the sound and fury that the, the, that's the, that's the main resemblance. They they were. They tried to replicate what happened January 6, but they uh, but they had a, a very different idea of what would happen. The, Bolsonaro was already out of power, right? So, what the January 6 uh, rioters, uh, what, what the January 6 insurrection wanted was to keep Trump in power. What the January 8 uh, insurrection is wanted was something even in a way even worse than. Reinstalling Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was already here in the United States at the time, but they wanted a military coup, right? So that's and and why they wanted that? Not because of what happened in January 6. They wanted that because of this long and deep history of military intervention in Brazilian politics. So uh, I think that's the crucial point to understand, and that may seem at at first a little difficult to grasp because the similarities seem too obvious. 
But uh, the role of the military in, in our countries is extremely, extremely different. You can, if we just compare uh, the Mili, uh, the the chief of the joint, I forgot, I forgot his title, uh, the, of the armed forces and uh, the joint command of the armed forces, or whatever, with the Brazil, the, the Brazilian commanders. The Brazilian commanders up to December, they were saying that the 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 Bolsonaro supporters who were in front of armed headquarters had to be respected. They were just exercised their free speech rights. There was nothing wrong with them. One of the well, the naval commander was insubordinate to the point he didn't accept to, uh, to, he didn't want to be in the, in the ceremony to give, co to transmit, to transmit the command to the next commander, right? And the next Navy commander. That's, that was unheard of because he didn't want to accept Lula's authority. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction among the military. I don't think they were ever close to actually trying to stall a dictatorship. They knew that it was just you, you don't start a dictatorship by force without popular support. This, uh, we, we have to have some popular support, have to have some international support. Otherwise, the country will just explode, right? And that's what happened with some countries, like such as Myanmar or something like that. So it's, and, uh, and that wasn't the case in Brazil. Unlike 1964, all the, all the, the, the media was against Bolsonaro, uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, the most of great bankers and, and industrialists were against were if, if not against Bolsonaro, but they were in favor of a, of a coup, unlike 1964. So these these rioters in January 8th were deluded, were living in, in a in an alternate reality. But what they wanted had a real basis in Brazilian history, which is this military uh, constant meddling in politics. And then you know, and, and you and you've both brought up, um, and especially at the end here, the media, right? So I'm kind of curious from your vantage point, um, the relative role and 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 space of the media in fostering, uh, you know, kind of both the polarization, but to the extent that you can also say the media may have played a role in creating parameters for the outcomes. I'm, I'm curious how you perceive the role of the media in the respective context vis-a-vis -vis the different developments? So that's a loaded question, <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm not going to walk into it. Uh, the, uh, I uh, strongly believe in uh, freedom of speech, uh, strongly believe in respecting differences, even if those differences are extreme, strongly believe in news outlets, media outlets expressing whatever view they want. And if they turn into uh, political actors on the stage, well, it's something we've seen um, throughout our history here. Uh, and it's something that uh, happens in uh, democracies uh, in other countries as well. Uh, and it's uh, become more of a factor because of the polarization we've seen in our societies. And so it manifests itself perhaps in more dangerous ways. But the flip side is always remembering that uh, respecting the space for, if we don't want to call it political debate anymore, but just mudslinging, um, I think I could go back to Andrew Jackson's um, election campaigns and uh, find uh, uh, the equivalents. And if historians are to be believed even worse, uh, except didn't have the reach of today's media or social media or the uh, impact of uh, the disaggregation of information sources and uh, the ability of misinformation to compete so effectively with what some of us still hope are objective facts out there that everybody can accept. And so a long way of saying the media was absolutely a factor um, in, uh, is a factor in, part of, in the polarization, but reflecting the polarization of society. Uh, I, I don't believe that media played a role in the most extreme manifestations, which were January 6th and January 8th. I think that those developed separately for the reasons uh, both of us have tried to uh, explain. Um, I note that uh, President Biden and President Lula in their statement at the White House when President Lula visited two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, added concerns about 
you know, how to address societal misinformation. And uh, but I'll just say again, this is a subject which is affecting global democratic politics. And I don't think there's an easy answer. And I don't think it plays into the decisions which lead to certain kinds of actions which can end up being extreme. I'm not going to blame social media for what happened on January 6th. It was a vehicle for mobilization, just like social media was a vehicle for mobilization uh, for January 8th uh, in, in Brazil. But the genesis motivation for what we saw is political. It's leaders. It's sentiments. It's polarization. It's a number of other factors. Uh, I will uh, just suggest something that neither of us have quite said uh, openly. It's this both in the United States and Brazil, um, we do have movements now, whether it's expressed through political parties or it's expressed uh, in more generic social movements. But there are right of center or very right wing views of how to organize uh, or approach uh, politics. And that's just a fact. And it's a reflection also, I think, in numerous European countries we can point to at the moment. And so what's interesting is, although both candidates lost their re-election uh, campaigns, uh, the legacy uh, continues to be uh, sort of a political questioning of how uh, democracy is carried out. And I think that's going to be the more important question to focus on in the, in the coming months and even years. Uh, I think that to get back to the question of, of, of media, I think the, the, the main point is that as just as the Brazilian uh, party system is is fragmented, the media, in a way, isn't uh, that. That's one reason the media is not as directly linked to political parties in Brazil, and also because Brazil had had a has a behemoth, an, an hegemon, which is hegemon global, and which is generally uh, center cent, centrist. Try to be centrist, so it's more liberal in time in terms of of uh, social mores, uh, but it's a little bit more conservative on economic policy. And uh, it was an opposition force uh, during moments of the crisis of the PT government, but it was also, from almost from the beginning, in opposition against most of, uh, of the policies that Bolsonaro tried to enact. Uh, so, and so we, there was the Bolsonaro government uh, was linked to the rise of some far right outlets but they were really, really small in comparison to to Fox News here in the United States. That's that's it's they're much they're much much weaker. Uh, there was there's, there was so there was some sort of social media and YouTube stars and whatever that that gained some attention, but did not have the reach. Uh, and, and and as the ambassador said, you can't say oh that's because. Of the of this me, of this media outlets, there was uh, uh, January six or, or January eight. They fomented this doubt, this this election denialism, but uh, they never said go and try an insurrection to destroy democracy or whatever. They were, they were part of this this uh, maelstrom, this chaos, but they were they were they weren't the main movers. They in a way they were just trying not to lose their audience. Both in Brazil and and in the and and the United States, and that's why, for instance, the most far right outlet, which, which is a, a kind of a talk show radio, Jovem Pan, they fired a lot of their far right commentators uh, after January 8th. They saw that the windows blow in a different direction. They tried to and they tried to adapt. So, you know, an advantage. Uh, Brazil has a lot of problems. One of the advantages that a lot of political actors are able of being of acting very opportunistically, so they don't need to keep this hard line, both in media and in, in politics, in defense of election denialism. There has been, as here in the United States, some attempts to to deny that that, that what happened in, in the in the insurrections were. Cruel crimes. They say there were Antifa, both in Brazil and the, in the United States. There's there's some idea like that. Or they say they're just patriots, or whatever. So there are some attempts at that, but it's but it's uh, but media usually doesn't play that much of a part. It's much more 
coming from the base in both countries than being direct, directed from the top. And I think that's the, that's the movement the ambassador was saying. It's, this movement is just an undeniable force. But uh, I think in Brazil, it, they are still less organized, less capable, because they don't have an obvious uh, outlet. Even, the, even Bolsonaro's party, the guy who's president of Bolsonaro's party, he, he was he supported Lula for 10 years, right? Lula's first vice president was from this guy's party. Uh, so this guy's, the only reason he's still supporting Bolsonaro is because then he'll get a lot of public money from, from his, uh, for his party. And half of the party is hard right Bolsonaro supporters, Half of the party just want to make money. So, in a way, this uh, this uh, opportunistic behavior allows Brazil to to, in a way, the government now, the administration now, it's a, it's it's a hostage to these politicians. But these politicians won't try to start coup because if there was a dictatorship, they would lose a lot of power as well. So. In a way, it's, it's, it makes democracy more imperfect, but also maybe a little bit safer in Brazil in comparison to the United States. So it's, it's a very unintended consequence of, uh, of opportunistic political behavior. Thank you. And, and so now we're reaching a part in our program where we're going to start to wind down. And um, I just want to pose two questions to the, each of you that are questions that are always part of the Unity Project's um, endings, right? So uh, the first question is, so at a time when divisions seem so deep, and here we're talking about the U.S. specifically, what gives you hope? Well, I, I would say... Um, Look, I'm just going to speak like anybody else in the room. Uh, I believe in our history. I believe in our institutions. I believe in uh, the strength of compromise in our political system over time and decades. There's moments of intense uh, tensions and disagreements, but uh, we've come through them uh, just in the last hundred years. We can point to everything from the 1930s to the 1960s, uh, and uh, we can certainly uh, point to this as another period when there is a very significant political debate over where we should be headed as a nation. But through it, we have an extraordinarily strong political system, which has the virtue of checks and balances, which sometimes work all too well. Uh, and in terms of preventing things like a budget, which I'd love to see um, out of a federal government, but which also have the benefit of uh, protecting rights, um, our democratic uh, traditions. We have uh, the most innovative uh, economy in the world, and we've been through this cycle now several times when our decline has been predicted and we bounce back um, over the decades. And uh, this is another period uh, where we're uh, showing uh, very significant leadership on, you know, the future greening, digitalization of our economy uh, moving forward. And uh, so, uh, and I also think there's a new generation or two coming up that have a very different view of some of these things. And I'm actually very encouraged by uh, the generation now in university, the one that has come out of university in recent years, who have a much more pragmatic approach to what needs to happen uh, to uh, make, make uh, our country a better place. So I remain optimistic about the future, and uh, it just means we have to work all that much harder because it's such a difficult moment we're living through. As a Brazilian, I'm a lot less optimistic about the future because, <laughs> because Brazil has always been the country of the future. We never arrive it and also be as a, as a supporter of a soccer team that has for the past 30 years has been a constant and unending failure uh, uh, which is Botafogo so uh, so I, but I think I, I concur with the ambassador on his last point I think we've done one thing that actually 
is makes me hopeful, and I think it's stronger here in the United States than in Brazil, is uh, the mobilization of young people in their 20s, in their, in their late teens. I think they, they are very politically conscious, they're, they're very active, they are worried about climate change, they're worried about inequality, because they they will suffer this, the the consequence of these problems uh, a lot more than the, than the than the generation there was there is still in power even though <laughs> maybe there wasn't there should be have been some sort of renovation both in Brazil and the United States right so we have we have uh, in Lula it has been the main figure of Brazilian politics since the democratization for 30 years right that's just not healthy yeah and even though I'm very grateful that if it wasn't for Lula. Bolsonaro would have been re-elected. That's that's a, that's a certainty. No one could have beaten Bolsonaro, but Lula. But uh, I don't think it's healthy that we needed him to 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 beat Bolsonaro. So I think what makes me hopeful in Brazil, but in Brazil, but even more so here in the United States, is uh, the mobilization of young of young people. And, and, and with that, I think a lot of us um, that, that you know that are part of the Vanderbilt community, I think we have a lot to be. You know, proud of in light of the last few days and, and the difficulty the city has been through, that Vanderbilt students um, were part of the leadership of mobilizing university students from across Nashville, from Belmont, Lipscomb, Fisk, uh, TSU, and in, in, in pushing and advocating for gun reform today. So, I mean, I think that these are kind of examples of of, of being front and center that um, that certainly um, are important. And then finally, as we conclude this evening, um, so how can each of us make a contribution to this healing? Uh, these are questions that the Unity Project has been, you know, keeping front and center as. So I'm no good at answering those questions because I've never understood how uh, individuals make a difference in a given political or social situation in the workplace, but they just do. And so uh, it uh, really comes down to individual motivation and opportunity, because if the opportunity doesn't present itself, it really doesn't matter how right you are uh, objectively or how convinced you are of your own rightness. Uh, you have to have uh, the opportunity uh, to mobilize. And I think what we're seeing in uh, the United States with the turnout we saw in 2020, which was the second highest on record, I believe, for a presidential election, but certainly the highest turnout for a presidential election in modern American history. Um, we're seeing, uh, and, and with the debates we're seeing, seeing at state level, our states are just so involved in different responses to all of the challenges we face as a nation. There's plenty of opportunities for individuals uh, to make their voices heard, whether it's town hall meetings, frankly, whether it's social media, sometimes captures the imagination in the most unusual ways, in a positive way. And, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, just caring about what happens at the local community level, which is a cliche in the United States, but we need to remember this is the country has the highest volunteerism rate in the world, uh, highest uh, uh, per capita contributions on charity. We already have strong civic engagement. Um, it's a question of deciding whether we think the issues that are being debated right now are important enough for us to mobilize in what I would hope is a move towards reaching consensus on some of the things that are dividing us as opposed to deepening those divisions. I'm not sure, how, uh, I guess, if, if it's possible to, to heal divisions, but I think we have to try. And I think the, the, the way to do it is acting uh, internally with the people. It's coordinating, act, it's collective action. An individual to, uh, can be mobilized, but this mobilization doesn't happen alone, right? So we need to do things together. And it, you have to talk to people. Even if you disagree on them, you have to talk to them. You can, you can disagree. Sometimes you will disagree. There's a lot of people I don't agree. There's a lot of people have stopped talking in the, in the past five years in Brazil. Uh, not my family. My, some of my family members were supporters of Bolsonaro because they were... Uh, retired military officers, so I won't stop talking to my uncle, even though he voted for Bolsonaro twice, but uh, and I have, to, I have to keep trying to talk to him and try to keep talking with as many people as you can and act collectively to pursue your goals, to make the world a better place, to 
fight for what we believe in. So I'm not sure if that, that may even increase divisions for a time. But in the end, that's the only way to, to change the world. Because the world uh, isn't uh, a dystopia, as sometimes both the far right and the far left make it seem. But it sure has a lot of room for improvement. And if, if there is... If division is what we needed for that, maybe that's just a phase we'll be able to overcome after a while. You know, I'm not I'm not very hopeful nor optimistic, but let's try in the spirit of the of the event. 